In this lesson, we're going to be taking a look at samples and surveys. And to begin this, we're going to start with terms and types of samples. Uh, first, let's talk about the difference between a population and a sample. The population is simply all members of a set. So if we're looking at people in a certain city, that's the population. If we're looking at boxes of cereal as they come off the assembly line, that is your population. Whatever set is being studied is your population. Now the sample is a part or subset of the population. Sample could be as small as one single item or the entire population itself. A, pop a subset that is the item is still considered a subset. So as we go through and talk about different things in samples and surveys, we're going to be talking about the sample group and how that relates. Now when we start talking about surveys there are four main types we're going to be looking at here. First is a convenience sample. And this is select members of a population who are conveniently and readily available. So if you're taking a survey or trying to find information about a group and you ask the first five people you run across that's a convenience sample. Um, if you ever stop at a place and there's people outside asking questions, that's a convenient sample because you're basically going to them just through your basic daily routine. Next is a self-selected sample. And this is members of a population who volunteer to participate in the sample. So if you go to a store and they say on your receipt there's information that you can fill out a survey and give your opinion and you choose to do that, that's a self-selected or a radio station or TV station uh, says to log on to their website and answer some questions about a current topics, that is self-selected. Typically you only get people who participate in these that have a very strong opinion one way or another. The neutral crowd normally doesn't participate. Next up is a systematic sample. And for this, you order the population in some way to make groups and then select from those groups in regular intervals. This is how polling is done on election night. They send representatives to every polling station, that's our groups, and then the pollsters ask every seventh person who completes their day of voting. They figure this is a good cross-section of your sample or of your population and can give fairly accurate results. Um, whenever you're taking a sample, as a side note, you need to make sure that you have an equal representation or a cross-group that represents the population as a whole. Our last method is the random sample. And in a random sample, all members of the population are equally likely to be selected. When you have a true random sample in the United States, a lot of times we simply go off of social security numbers. Um, everybody who's born and on the legal record has a social security number. So each of these methods of sampling has its uh, advantages and disadvantages. And we're going to take a look at how to use these in order to conduct valid samples and surveys. Now when we conduct a study, there's two different types and then surveys can be a part of that. The first is an observational study, which is a method of taking data from a sample or population that does not interfere with the members of the study in any way. Um, a lot of times when you're looking at research being done on television, they show a room with people in it and others standing behind a glass wall. Um, on the inside of the room, that glass wall appears to be a mirror. So the people in the sample or in the study can go about their normal activity and those on the outside who are doing the study can see how they interact in a normal method. Nothing is different about their way of life. Next, a controlled study. And this is where the subjects are divided randomly into two groups, where one group receives a treatment and the other does not. In medical situations, when they're testing the effects of a new medication or drug, they will divide people and 
random fashion into two equal groups, and people in one group will be given the pill that they're trying to study, and people in the other group will be given what's called a placebo, and a pill that looks exactly like the other one, but has no actual medicinal purposes to it. It'll have flour or sugar or something of substance, but no actual medicine. And then they observe the changes that happen between the two different groups. Now, carrying out a study, either observational or controlled, has effects on people and the population or the sample and allows you to find out information. Another way of finding information that sometimes is harder to observe, such as feelings or emotions, is through a survey. And a survey, technically, is when members of a population or sample are asked a series of non-biased questions and the responses are recorded. Now, the trick of a survey is to get a good group of non-biased questions. If there's anything leading in it or influential, it can affect the outcome of people's answers, such as what do you think the United States military should do about the madmen who control whatever nation? By inserting the word madmen, it influences the person's view of that situation. Um, a lot of words can be used or inserted to influence or guide people. Um, and the wording a sample or a survey question so that is completely devoid of bias is very difficult at times. It often takes several drafts to make it come out properly. Let's take a look at how we can do such a survey question. We're going to design a survey that will answer the following question. What percent of the population of voters in your state are able to identify their senators, representatives, and governor by name? Now, this situation is one that we cannot conduct for an entire population. There would be no feasible way of finding every registered voter and asking them the questions. So, what you can do is take a form of convenience sample. Go to people in a selected neighborhood and ask them. Next, we will take a list of names to the people and ask them to identify. Now, this list cannot be in any particular order, and in order to keep it truly unbiased, people who are not of the group being looked at, senators, representatives, or governor, should also be included on the list, such as local city council members. That way, it's also people in the political field. Then, we will record the successes. In this case, we'll record the number of people who were able to identify the names of these people as opposed to those that are not. Uh, questions that might be asked when the list of names is given is which person on this list is our governor? Which person is your representative in the House? And which person or people, if you have both of them, are the senators from our state to the National Senate. By asking simple questions, you'd be able to get simple direct answers. Then you take that record of those that were able to successfully do it, as opposed to the total population or sample size that you asked, and you get a percentage, and if your sample is a fair representation of the entire population, you'd be able to extrapolate that out and make a fair guess as to those in the total population that would be able to answer likewise. So with samples and surveys, a lot of vocabulary, a lot of different methods that are being used to take down information. Uh, make sure you have this vocabulary down and examples of your own ready to be used.